Well, what do you do uh, to relax? Uh, smoke oh. marijuana. <laughs> You were joking when you said that, of course. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> While the question of who truly invented heavy metal may never be settled, one thing is for certain, there can be but one Black Sabbath. Whether it's the infamous Aussie incarnation, Dio, Hughes, Martin, Gillen, or... Gillen, the darksome specter of Sabbath has dispensed Birmingham badassery since the 60s. As always, if you want to jump to your album of choice, click the description below and you'll see its timestamp for your convenience. Caterwauling convicted cat burglar Ozzy Osbourne, bipedal riff generator Tony Iommi, free swinging skin basher Bill Ward, fearsome lyricist and four string messiah geezer, goddamn butler, metal mythos, he is back bitches with the band that started it all. Sabbath. At the time, I was heavily into the occult and stuff, astral plane and all that, cobblers. I suggested, among other things, Black Sabbath, and everyone, oh yeah, that's a good name. But this, this is a name which has got connotations, Black Sabbath, hasn't it? Well, you know, so the Rolling Stones got something to do with landslides, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And we went to play at this first gig and they absolutely hated us. And I'll never forget the bloke, this bloke came up, yeah, you know, like a Scots bloke, you sing as crap. And I was just standing there going, <laughs> <laughs> you sing as crap, get your other singer back. It was just one of those things, you know. Um, and then of course we had to see the agent and said, well, you're not going down very well. <laughs> <laughs> Much is made of the so-called British invasion of the 50s and 60s. The Beatles, the zombies, some superb fucking acts washed up on American shores during the Eisenhower era. But what few acknowledge today, apart from the bands themselves that is, is that the movement owed its entirety to the blues. And so the eternal transatlantic tennis match began. And so from the seeds of a brummy blues band by the name of Earth, germinated the malevolent intonations of one of rock's immutable motherfucking pioneers. Flailing away around the Birmingham bar scene, the future was anything but bright. So profoundly fucking dim, in fact, that for a blink and you miss it moment, Iomi was briefly a member of Jethro Tull. And then that was for me real strict work because it was like nine o'clock in the morning rehearsals on the dot and I, i'd never experienced that oh, bloody hell this is you know nine o'clock in the morning getting up at eight o'clock to get there for them. and it, but it really done me a lot of good and i only stayed a month with them and I, I it wasn't for me you know but it was great because when i came back we got the band back together again and then we changed our name to sabbath and whatever but it was good because it it, it gave me the the insight to see that that's what we should be doing. We've got to start early in the morning, we've got to rehearse strict. The material started changing from, the, from, the, from then on when we started playing. And we came up with this sort of music that I, I don't, none of us can really explain what it was. It was just, we just liked it. But with that musical marriage going over like a butcher at a bris, it wasn't long before Tony returned and the composition he brought with him, with lyrics inspired by a demonic dream from Ozzy and or bassist Geezer Butler, depending on whose acid flashbacks are more reliable, would not only give the band its name, but define a fucking genre. The first song we, we wrote was actually Wicked World. <laughs> And then the second song was Black Sabbath. I was a medium-sized fan of uh, Holt, the Planet Suite, particularly Mars in those days. And one of the days I was in the, uh, we were rehearsing and I was going, trying to play Mars. And then the next day, Tony went in and went. As 
we've cataloged exhaustively here on Metal Mythos, some influential albums fail to live up to the omnipresent hype. Black Sabbath ain't fucking one of them, not only comporting its own admirably against even high-water masterpieces like Paranoid or Master of Reality, but making a strong argument for itself as the finest album of their fucking career, and it all came right out of the gate. Bill Ward's bluesy percussion pounding beneath an Iomi guitar tone thicker than freeze-dried Vegemite, aided immeasurably by Luciferian lyrics and head bob and bass work from Geezer, Butler, and oh, let us not forget the inimitable Ozzy wailing like a war orphan over top. There was nothing like it then, and despite five fucking decades of imitators, frankly, there still fucking ain't. But perhaps the most persuasive testament to the enduring quality of the album itself is that many of its classic cuts are still featured in the fucking rotation with the title track and NIB still prominently positioned in the Sabbath stage show right up to the retirement tour, not to mention the metallic Titanic behind the wall of sleep. Is the album influential? I don't know, let's ask King's X. catalog every cunt flap that ever ganked an Iomi riff, we'd be here from now to revelation. Suffice to say, this album, like the band that banged it out, is agonizingly influential. Even deep cuts like Cover Tune, Evil Woman, and the somnolent Sleeping Village boast atmospherics abundant. Recorded in just two days, on a budget that wouldn't buy a half-decent second-hand fucking motorcycle, the spontaneity and adolescent inspiration abounds on this badass record. The Freshman Sabbath salvo requires no fucking salesmanship. You've heard it on every classic rock station worth a good goddamn, and with excellent reason, it rips. But as with all early Sabbath, it also ain't alone. It wasn't until we got back from Europe that, that the album, we realised the album was in the charts. Listening to the countdown and the guy says, Black Sabbath, and we went, what? <laughs> and we thought, is there two Black Sabbaths or something? <laughs> Overplayed? Oh, indubitably. But as I asserted in my coverage of Motorhead's masterpiece Ace of Spades, some shit is overplayed for a fucking reason. Smashing through the charts at number one in the UK and number 12 in the States, strangely enough, it was in the US where Sabbath's sophomore release would go four times fucking platinum. Paranoid, as a result, established a sterling run of early 70s stunners, almost all of which charted in the stratosphere, transforming the four fuck-ups from Birmingham to the most reluctant pop stars in human history. We sort of started attracting all the wrong sort of people then, which was, the, you know, the screaming kids and stuff, which we thought, bloody hell, this is all weird. We were very, I think, probably afraid, or at least I felt fearful of uh, being a pop band. Such is the case with the ageless audio pummeling that is Paranoid, a doom metal masterpiece that cranks up the catchiness and the aggression in equal measure. You've heard half this shit in everything from car commercials to political rallies to ads for preparation fucking H. Paranoid, the immortal Iron Man, but dig deep here and there's some second look gems, with the best of the bunch being the dark majesty of anti-heroin anthem, Hand of Doom. Once I finished the tour of Vietnam, Instead of going straight back to America, they'd have to have like a halfway house. Nothing on the news about this. There was no programs telling you that the US troops in Vietnam were all, to get through that horrible war. Well, like fixing up and all this kind of thing. It just stuck in my head and when we did Hand of Doom, that's what I wrote it about. Debut 
saw the sound of heavy metal come screaming into the world, Paranoid was the debut of Sabbath as songwriters. But the hippie horse shit was still waiting in the wings via the aimless meanderings of Planet Caravan. I get that it's got its fans, but to me, like many more improvisational asides from early Sabbath, this is little more than a stonerific practice recording cranked out to fill space so they can score another sack of Bogota's best. And I'll go one further just to piss off the entire planet. War pigs? Eh. I prefer the original version toured as Walpurgis before it was hastily, of course, retitled to placate the wilting violets in evangelical Christianity and capitalize on the hairy-ass hippie market. And evidently so did Ozzy, because even after the song was retitled, he continued to sing the original Walpurgis lyrics and made sure to include the original recording on his best-of compilation, The Oz Man Cometh, many moons later. Originally intended to be entitled War Pigs, with a working cover featuring a sword-wielding, wizened fat fuck evidently intended to be a fucking war pig, when the song Paranoid was penned at the 11th hour, it was evident to all that between the Vietnam implications possibly impacting American sales, and obvious commercial potential from Paranoid, a hasty change of title needed to be made, albeit too late for anyone to change the fucking album sleeve. And it's a good thing it was. NME famously raved the disc really lives up to its title as an uninhibited freakout. Folks, you know a record is good when not even the new musical express can find a believable way to fucking shit on it. Released the very same day Jimi Hendrix shuffled off this mortal coil, Paranoid quite literally murdered the hippie generation. A pounding testament to how unstoppable Sabbath was in the early 70s. But oh, Ozzy and the boys, we're just getting started. I think it wasn't until the third album that we started getting like a lot of money. First thing we did was go out and buy ourselves rollers and Lamborghinis and all that kind of stuff. We were all into buying houses and cars and, you know, the things you do. And, uh, oh yeah, that's right, we're in a band, aren't we? Black Sabbath was done in two days and, um, Paranoid was, uh, was five, five days to a week. It took us to do that, finish it. But Massive Reality was quite a different thing. That took a lot longer. That's when we started getting into long time for us. It was going into weeks. I mean, oh, God, this is taking a bit long. I think, I think any past product you listen to, you always go, oh, dear, we could have done this and we could have done that. And, but for the time, no, I think it was, it was all right. We're working up a lather now, my friends. While Sabbath savaged our virgin ears with the opening doom metal duo of Black Sabbath and Paranoid, for me... This is when their legendary status was cemented. Immutable, inarguable proof that Sabbath were here to stay, and their songwriting was the reason why. And while erstwhile offerings would vacillate in quality from track to track here, good luck finding a fucking dud from the opening cough loop of leering pothead anthem Sweet Leaf, which I'm certain is about the merits of maple syrup, to the closing cacophony of the immortal Into the Void. This album is an unbridled audio vivisection, and none cuts deeper than the ageless anthem that almost single-handedly assassinated the hippie generation, Children of the Grave. My single favorite Sabbath tune of all time. And yes, you're so very welcome, Glenn Danzig. that's not fair. After all, the first five Sabbath albums have been ripped off, re-ripped off, and re-re-re-re-re-ripped off with a frequency to rival Dita Von Teese's nipple tape. Why single Danzig out when so many metal bands have copped the Sabbath sound in its entirety?
potential scarcely fucking covers it, but head and shoulders among all the evolutions on offer here is Iomi's guitar tone, which while heavier than a Wheel of Fortune contestant on the first two fucking records, was full bore brontosaurus Fuck huge here! Thicker than the La Brea tar pits, nastier than a Leslie Jones Les tape with a spine-snapping heaviness that has rarely been equaled in the 40-year fucking interim. While Iomi is always Iomi and therefore a doom metal demigod, on subsequent releases in the short term, he would begin a gradual descent into a more articulated technical style, less, less reliant on the titanic tone featured on this beast in particular right here. Nothing necessarily wrong with that. That, folks, but it bears a cursory mention regardless. And as for the reasons behind the booming bottom end, contrary to popular myth, it was on this album, not the debut, that Tony Iommi at last downtuned his guitar as the accident he suffered to one of the fingers on his right hand, ironically the day he quit at a nearby factory, made the slack and drop D tuning more comfortable to fucking fret. I worked in a factory doing welding and stuff. It's really peculiar because I was going to leave the job that that day. I just joined the band. So they put me on this sheet metal machine where it comes down and chops and bends metal. Of course, uh, I had not a clue about it. I'd never worked on it before. And I got my hand in it just went... <laughs> I, I went into such a deep depression. We had to make false fingers, really. And he made them out of old um, plastic bottle tops that he'd melt onto his fingers and then put some leather over the top. Because I, I took the ends of my fingers off, it made me create a, a different style of playing. I had to work on vibrato, I had to work on how hard to press on the strings because obviously I couldn't feel anything apart from pain. You couldn't feel how much you bend in the string like you could with your, your finger. There's no feel in that. The result? The ascent of stoner doom metal. While the classic albums don't necessarily end here, of the initial Aussie era explosion, at least in my opinion, Master of Reality is the uncontested creative apex. The ideal capstone to the 10 ton triumvirate of the first three records, second only to one other release you'll fucking see soon. This album is an outright institution. Don't dig it, consider being committed to one. Next! <laughs> These great big chewings are the best, best hash you could ever imagine. We'd smoke these until like, the very last second that we had to go on stage. And um, well, this one night we went on stage and <laughs> he thought he was playing the flute, but the flute was down here on his chin. He was just blowing into the microphone. <laughs> so all the audience was here and was just... <laughs> <laughs> and he had his eyes closed. So as he got this great big mirror out of the dressing room and dragged it on stage and put it right in front of him while he was doing this thing. <laughs> so he finished what he thought was his flute solo and opened his eyes and seen himself and he's, he's just... <laughs> <laughs> That was good for us at the time we'd done Volume 4 because it was the first time I think we'd actually recorded in America and we went over to LA and it was great, it was great times. Uh, it was a whole new thing to be recording in sort of record plant and, and we, we thoroughly enjoyed it, it was good. Now here's where we wander a bit far afield in my eyes, and by design might I add. In the wake of successfully cracking America and the charts in the process, now four fucking albums deep, the Brummy foursome were eager to expand their horizons. Having shit-canned their original manager two albums back in favor of enlisting the legal representation of the infamous Don Arden, whose daughter Sharon would prove to be instrumental to both the career and cock of Ozzy Osbourne, it wasn't long before it bit him in the ass. But more on that mess in a motherfucking half later. And so in sound production, management, and virtually everything the fuck else, Black Sabbath were hitting the hard reset button, setting a Sabbath standard that would endure for the remainder of the decade, whereby the band themselves produced their records, a then-radical move imitated by many a metal neophyte in the years to come. As such, Snowblind, as it was originally entitled, features a marked amelioration of the previously dismal dreariness of their earlier repute. The record volume 4 that was going to be originally called Snowblind. 
but no, they, they, wouldn't, have they wouldn't have it. There's no way, man. You know. Make a change at the last minute to volume yeah, four. But it's like um, it's all going on. Everybody's doing all these things. But it's like, oh, don't mention that, man. You know that that'll shock too many people. People, have, why do people have to be shocked? to realize what's going on all the time. Typified by the noticeable thinning of Iomi's formerly corpulent guitar tone, shedding the improbably thick drone of Black Sabbath and Master of Reality for a more standard 70s hard rock tone that, to be fair, fucking crushes all the same. But while the Black Sabbath sound was undeniably brightening, the darksome specter of the early years still yielded a fair few doom metal masterclasses, such as Cornucopia, the opening of which contains one of the most inherently evil riffs ever hatched from Tony Iommi's malevolent mustache. And speaking of unbridled evil, while many may focus on catchier affairs like Snowblind or the haunting ballad Changes, for me the honor of finest track in the fucking album goes to the doom metal Mastodon known as Under the Sun. As the working title Snowblind suggests, substance abuse informed virtually all of the omnipresent changes swirling the fuck around the band at this time, with Bill Ward soused for the fucking duration to the point that Cornucopia almost couldn't be fucking recorded, and Ozzy losing entire evenings to fistfuls of what I'm sure was confectioner sugar. It's no mystery why Snowblind was the first thought on everyone's mind. Initially, drugs were, were helpful. I found. Ego, drugs, alcohol and women were the biggest. I should say alcohol and drugs were the two main ones. When we first came to the States, then it got pretty heavy into, you know, cocaine and, and uh, the rest of the stuff that goes with it. The title, of course, was overruled by record company execs in the end, but fortunately, the fucking songwriting wasn't. Volume 4 is still a classic, but all but a sonic speed bump compared to what came next. We had this thing going on with each other that was very strange, and, and Geezer in particular had all sorts of weird dreams and weird thoughts. You know. It might have been the acid, I don't know. <laughs> There's no point denying it, by 73, Black Sabbath were burned the fuck out. Baked out of their gourds on who the merry fuck knows, and snorting everything from coke to comet to ground up fucking Pez if they could pinch out another record in the process. We had this massive big mansion in Bel Air. We had, I think, every pusher in LA. We used to have it in uh, cer uh, cereal boxes of cocaine delivered to the house. We just tip it into this big bowl, and so we go... <laughs> A bit like Scarface. And when you live that hard and roll that fast, eventually the piper comes knocking. And knock he did. Hard. By the time the Sabbath bloody Sabbath session started, an overworked, not to mention overcoked Iomi was feeling the pressure of being the primary songwriter. Proof positive that even a glorified goddamn riff machine needs a rest and a lube job on occasion. And so when they sat in the studio, guitar in hand, and Tony Iomi reached once more into that bottomless bag of tricks, for the first time in Sabbath history, he rolled snake eyes. Nothing. Not a riff, not a halfway decent jam session, zero with a side of zilch. And his baked ass band, barely anchored to this earth by this point, could do little more than stare on in wide eyed amazement. It was all left on Tony's Tony Army's shoulder to pull it, do, to do it all, you know. I thought, if I don't come up with anything, we don't do anything. Because they were waiting for an initial riff. And without the initial riff, you what do you do? Because we were a riff-based band, you know. I just didn't know what the hell to write about anymore. I mean, I... <laughs> and so, in a last-ditch effort to hand-jive those creative juices, they set up shop in the ruins of an ancient castle. We rehearsed in this castle once in, um, in uh, Wales. It was. We really, I've got to be honest, we frightened the life out of each other. We had to leave in the end. Everybody terrified each other because we were playing jokes on each other. Nobody knew who was doing it, you know, and... Um, 
<laughs> it was just got ridiculous, so we used to leave and drive all the way home and drive back the next day. Yet despite the distractions, it was there, in the pitted rubble of a reputedly haunted citadel, that the Riffmaster General came roaring back to life and outspilled Sabbath, bloody Sabbath. <laughs> From substance abuse standard killing yourself to live, to deeper cuts like Spiral Architect, classic after classic came careening out of Iomi's amp one after another, but the best of the bunch is the speedy blues metal stunner, Sabracadabra. <laughs> Sabbath Bloody Sabbath is a sacrosanct metal masterpiece, the ultimate expression of all the ageless merits of the beast that is Black Sabbath, one which draws on their darker earlier material while expanding the boundaries all the while, without once dispensing with their core character in the process, a delicate high wire act that ends with a stuck fucking landing. A bit on the experimental side? Sure, but ain't nothing wrong with an experiment as long as it pays off, and Sabbath Bloody Sabbath does. Buy it, bitch! People have said to me, which, which was the pinnacle of Sabbath? To me, the Sabbath bloody Sabbath, I'm not saying anything else is bad or worse, but we'd really it just put our heads level together, then, didn't we it? just put our heads together, we were really into what we were doing. <laughs> paranoid progressive streak achieving full flight on the previous outing, it stands to reason the follow-up would represent a profound overcorrection. Sabbath, to their eternal credit, resisted said urge, crafting a more direct, rock-oriented release while avoiding the all-too-tempting pitfall of eschewing their earlier experimentation. The result? The aptly titled Sabotage, an album with so many quasi-conspiratorial factors arrayed around it, the band recorded it in its entirety at night, as they'd been pumped in the dumper by their previous manager, necessitating they spend their days nodding the fuck off in court. Management was getting most of the money that we were earning and stuff like that, so we didn't feel any different. She sort of moved out of, say, the, the not very nice areas of Birmingham into an even worse area. The management we had never made, never let us realise how, 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 how big we were, you know. We always used to think we were lo lower than Zeppelin. We were lower than, you know, we were always kept, made, we used to share rooms for Christ's sake for, for many years until, until we demanded our own rooms on the road. I mean, we were ripped off ruthlessly, so I was just raped. And I said to, I said to, my, I said to my, my ex manager, I like to be kissed when I'm getting fucked, you know. Look, the lawsuit was a laugh and a half, but the resultant frustration gave rise to ravenous aggression, as utterly encapsulated by what remains perhaps Ozzy's most intense vocal performance on a record to date. The food of love became the greed of our time, and now we're living on the profits of crime. But as I said, sabotage lacks nothing in the experimentation department, as encapsulated in the masterful, sprawling epic and clear fucking frontrunner from one of my favorite Sabbath tunes full stop, the near 10 minute masterpiece, Megalomania. <laughs> nits to pick with the proceedings, it's that Megalomania would have been best served to carve some of the frills and fucking fat and jump straight to the meat of the murderous Iomi riff. Venom, for example, would cover the tune on the underrated Prime Evil album and improve it drastically in the process. It bears mention that Sabotage featured the first of several Ozzy Leaves the Band scares. It was time to go, it was like, uh, 
We were all going... We, they were frustrated with me and I was frustrated with them. We weren't going anywhere musically. We weren't doing... There was no challenge there because we knew as the name Black Sabbath we could go out and pull a crowd anywhere and make a living. We could tick over. A routine that would continue for the remainder of the decade. While I appreciate much of the material to follow, the common perception is that sabotage serves as the unofficial end cap for the so-called classic Sabbath. And for the original Aussie era, at least, I have to concede that's largely correct. But suffer no slight against sabotage. From hole in the sky to symptom of the universe, it's stacked to the ceiling with masterful mid-70s Sabbath tunes. Worth a buy? You bet your bulbous ass it is! Next! I was just on stage and I was putting out like, all these thousands of watts of music like, and all these people were getting into it, it was a whole thing. The energy that I got from it, it, it <coughs> this, this thing just flashed into my mind, technical ecstasy. Yeah. Is the music loud on stage? What? My bass <laughs> isn't. Um, fucking hell. <laughs> fucking cool here. Yeah. My mum phoned me up the other night, she lives in England, she said, can you tell Geezer to turn down a bit? We're playing in fucking New York. Widely appraised as a point where the British food hit the fan for Black Sabbath, technical ecstasy is simultaneously reviled, ignored, and reflexively fucking defended. In short, it's the musical Hideo Kojima. This metal mythos is fortuitous because while I love Black Sabbath, I love the Aussie era infinitely less so, and as such, lack any such baggage on the subject. Encountering this album with fresh ears unencumbered by the incumbent expectations of more experienced fucking fans? Eh, I think it's all right. Some rockers, some droners, some more progressive preening a la Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, and Sabotage. In short, to the untrained ear, it's an earnest, if occasionally aimless, hard rock record. I don't class ourselves as heavy metal. I know a lot of people do. We've always come from the hard rock based thing. Were Black Sabbath capable of better? Fucking A they were. They'd done so two titty fucking albums ago, and they would two albums hence, might I add. But there's nothing offensively bad about Black Sabbath technical ecstasy. Goofy-ass Latter-day Genesis-looking cover art notwithstanding. Seriously, what the springtime fresh fuck am I looking at here? An egg playing laser tag with a fucking Lego? It bears mention that by this point, Brian May of Mythos Luminaries Queen was a fixture in the fucking studio with Tony Iommi, and the influence is evident in almost every every song, from the operatic aside of Prog Doom Experiment, You Won't Change Me, to the more florid fills of Bill Ward and Tony respectively, the early Queen sound, albeit with a Black Sabbath veneer, is eminently detectable here. Well, our backgrounds aren't that much different, you know, we were probably both playing Shadows numbers about yes. 40 years ago, you know. Oh. <laughs> 30 years ago. Either way, as evidenced by the continued inclusion of dirty women in the Latter-day Sabbath set, clearly technical ecstasy was never a complete loss. And so, from generation to generation, I'd venture to say more metal fans have unwittingly stumbled on this single album expecting precisely nothing and come away pleasantly surprised than perhaps any other, at least, Aussie-era release. The 2012 remaster is much improved on the sound front, the songs have surprisingly endured over the ages, and as such, Technical Ecstasy is irrefutably recommended. But Black Sabbath now subsisted beneath a black cloud, and so after damn near a half-decade of infighting with Ozzy, the brummy burnouts reached a very British boiling point. Did you have, have warning that Ozzy was going to go? We were rehearsing it anyway for this album, and he left. Ah, the 
ironically titled, Never Say Die. The final Ozzy Sabbath album of the 70s is oft mythologized, is unjustly reviled, and a record so steeped to its sack and baggage and bullshit you can scarcely hear the music over the din of drama surrounding it. Long story short, in all of a fucking year, Ozzy Osbourne was fired and or quit. Fucking twice. Look, you can ramble on about Ozzy's abuse of alcohol and drugs, the absence of a coherent creative direction, and whatever the fuck else all you like. Distilled to its essence, in retrospect, the same thing happened to Sabbath that happened to a million bands before and after. The early years were great and all, but as the songwriting matured, the fathers of heavy metal were metamorphosing into either an Ozzy band or an Iomi band. And from Sabotage to Never Say Die, it was excruciatingly evident the band wasn't big enough for the both of them. We've got a situation that's supposed to be a band, yet whatever Tony wanted, he got. It just wasn't working, things just wasn't happening. We were ended up recording for 11, well, rehearsing for 11 months and nothing was coming up. So we'd come up with plenty of riffs and stuff, but no, there was no enthusiasm. And and so the sabotage era spats eventually flowered into a full-on fucking replacement. Dave Walker of Fleetwood Mac fame, I believe, who was recorded and even fucking filmed performing material from the era with Iommi and the boys. We had to write all new songs because we were due to go in the studio and we got this other singer, Dave Walker, who used to be with Savoy Brown and Fleetwood yeah. Mac we'd done a bit with. <laughs> You know, they were friends of mine from Birmingham. They were very uh, helpful in me joining Civil Brown. Tony was, and um, I, I remember we uh, we were at this pub or someplace, and uh, Ozzy came out, and Ozzy's a nice dude. And I remember I felt really sorry for him because he was he I don't know he, he was just going through some awful crap I think at the time. But they were all of the opinion. Bill Ward especially, I think, that I was, like, totally wrong for it. And he was right, I was totally wrong for it. And so we had him for a bit, and that really didn't work out. And then Ozzy wanted to come back, and we wanted Ozzy back. So Ozzy came back, and we did the Never Say Die album. And as we were doing it, I just knew that it's the end. Look, Walker was all well and good, soulsy, pretty bitchin' if I'm being perfectly honest, if a bit of an oddball in Black Sabbath, but by the time the band hit the studio, and by studio, I mean a balls-freezing, repurposed fucking cinemaplex where Sabbath would snort the hours away by day and shit out never say die by night. Needless to say, Ozzy was already itching to return. And so he did. With sacks upon sacks of snow and tow. And that's just the fucking preload, folks. The music... Well, it's just goddamn decent rock. As someone who pretty much fucking yawns at the original Aussie incarnation of Black Sabbath, even I don't get the hate here, people. Junior's Eyes? Solid. Never Say Die? A little upbeat and vacuous, but once again, solid. Johnny Blade? Full-on fucking boss. Objectively assessed, in some ways, what this record lacks in the vintage Sabbath sound, it augurs for the upcoming Ozzy solo career with its stripped-down, guitar-centric assault. Iommi, for his part, alleges that never before the band's recording process been more rushed... When he came back, we'd written some songs and he wouldn't sing them, and we were due to do, a, do this album, Never Say Die, and we, off we went to Canada to record it. To record an album we hadn't got any songs for, basically. Um, so we had to start rehearsing in the morning at nine o'clock because we were recording on the evening so it really got difficult we were trying to write a song and then record it on the night so we couldn't relate to it you can't do that we didn't live with them and whatever and it was i'm surprised we ever managed to do an album and if that's the case black sabbath should rush more fucking often it ain't master of reality or anything but after the pseudo technical twattery of the preceding effort it's at least a solid seven out of ten and deserves a second look if you've previously written it the fuck off as the audio demise of the band either way to bill ward's delight ozzy was back only to be sacked 17 minutes later, sending Ozzy into a downward spiral of protracted narcosis. When it came to the firing of me, he got Bill, who was my best friend, who was my, the, my closest member of, of Black Sabbath, to come and do the dirty deed. He didn't have the, I didn't see him. He was locked away in his room. Tony has spoken to me 
uh, about this and I felt at that particular time I was very dishonest you know and I felt dishonest in my um, in my uh, support towards Tony. It was it was a very sad period. I remember leaving there. I locked myself in a hotel room for three three months, just getting smashed out of my brains every day, you know. And then nothing happened for the next twenty years, and they were on vacation. <laughs> Sorry, still working on my Sharon Osbourne impression. Sabbath may have kicked Ozzy to the curb, but he'd soon emerge like a fucked up phoenix, which is a story for another mythos. Meanwhile, Sabbath, we're back to square one. Walker was out and Ozzy insensate, but thanks to Tony's never say die spirit, it wasn't quite time to phone for the heavy metal hearse. I mean, we come up with some rips, but you know, Ozzy just wouldn't sing them. He just wasn't in the, he just wasn't into it. So, um, I called Ronnie up. Well, I spoke to him on the phone and I met him over at, at Don Arden's house at the party. We spoke about things. And so uh, I said, do you want to come over and have a, have a play with us and see how we get on? You know, my first opportunity to meet Tony in, in the flesh and Geezer and Bill. We wrote a song called Children of the Sea that night. Maybe a lot of people don't understand is we had a hell of a lot of problems to do that album. Mm -hmm. I mean, we started it in L.A. and ended up in Miami doing it. Um, who knew what was going to happen? We were kind of outcasts at that particular point. We seemed to be men without a country, men without a label. We had a label, but men, men without a manager and, mm. and men without feet. We were men without hats. We were men without <laughs> everything at that particular point. Exit Ozzy. Enter Ronnie. While he'd conquered the world with Richie Blackmore's proto-power metal Colossus Rainbow, in a mass market context, the Dio dictatorship begins right the fuck here. In dire need of a front man, Iommi inquired of the diminutive powerhouse in question, and to both men's amazement, he responded in the affirmative. But fuck that biographical bullshit, this is metal mythos, and it's all about the music. Heaven and Hell is one of the most awe-inspiring career revivals to which we've ever borne witness. From the opening strains of the galloping Neon Knights, the reborn Black Sabbath savages ahead with newfound gravitas and atmospheric ear candy aplenty. Gone were the stonerific stylings of the Aussie era, in favor of a more polished approach, reflective of the band's already legendary status. The Oz Band may be M.I.A., but three quarters of the fucking band weren't, and they've scarcely played better in their five decades of heavy metal menstruations. And it cracked the charts hard, topping every Black Sabbath album to date, save the tandem of Paranoid and Master of Reality, in America at least. In the land of milk and mutton, the snobby ass Brits were somewhat more reserved, affording it a mere silver certification. I can only assume because we didn't boil it first. And the timing wasn't too shabby either. While they couldn't have possibly predicted the eventuality, the band's glossy new production and soaring singer inadvertently affixed them to the tip of the arrowhead for an all-new metal movement, the so-called new wave of British heavy metal, of which their new sound was an unintended archetype. Moreover, Heaven and Hell emphatically established that Black Sabbath was more than any one of its parts. It was an ethos and an aesthetic as much as it was a collection of individuals. Except Iommi, of course. No Iommi, no fucking band, bitch. Deal with it. The album also marks the introduction of an unspoken mainstay in the Sabbath camp I'd be remiss not to mention. Long-standing keyboardist Jeff Nichols, whose presence not only provided a much-needed sense of stability in the eternal flux of the fucking 80s, but whose pen was often responsible for many of the standout tracks of the self-same era. He passed away, I believe, last year, and he's criminally undermentioned, but until his untimely death in 2017, he was the undercover fifth member of Black Sabbath and should be acknowledged as such. If you need a sales spiel to pick up an immortal classic like Heaven and Hell, my condolences on your incoming fucking taste transplant. But the Dio era was just getting started. To overcome all of the, uh, the problems that were laid in front of us made that album so much more pleasing to us that we were able to go, ha, -ha see, yeah. check this out. <laughs> 
and so too was the eternal schism. Betwixt those who appreciated the unprecedented artistic and commercial revivification Ronnie breathed into Black Sabbath, and the simpering shit stains who still shrieked the words, Ozzy or nothing, man! Fire up that fucking rant alert! <laughs> Worse still, thanks largely to the planet-pulverizing insecurity of Ozzy, the rivalry was effectively fucking endorsed and instigated by at least one of the bands in question. Almost immediately, Oz was dropping trowel on Tony Iommi's head, and with Tony having found a new toy, his ire became focused squarely on Ronnie James Dio. Now, while much of the footage of Ozzy pinching logs on Lord Dio in the press has since been purged from the interwebs, gosh, I wonder by whom, take my word for it, Ozzy was fucking shook. I mean, that ain't gonna praise me. I ain't gonna praise them because we didn't leave it in a, I didn't leave it, we didn't separate in a, uh, a happy mode, you shall we say. We didn't go well, see you later, guys, you know, enjoy it. They should stop that name now because it's, it's like dragging the dead horse even further, but I don't think they will. I don't, I don't, to be honest, I don't think they got the nerve to. According to bassist cum ghost songwriter Bob Daisley, in the early sessions for the Blizzard of Oz album, he would literally check the minute-by-minute -minute chart positions for Black Sabbath, Heaven, and Hell, and became positively despondent when it not only became the third best-selling Black Sabbath album of all time, but when Randy Rhodes played the record during a recording session one day, he lost it and lashed out, labeling Black Sabbath's new frontman illegitimate, and paying a full fucking salary to a literal midget just so he could take him out on tour and call him Ronnie. You know, like, like I use a, 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 a midget, uh, a dwarf, as he, as he so correctly put me right. He's not a midget, he's a dwarf, and he's, uh, I do some tricks with this, this, uh, this We'll show you the dwarf's entrance here. The dwarf comes Give up. Give him that one away. Not anymore. Well, not the anymore. dwarf comes up through this entrance here. Yes, gang. Ozzy is that insecure. And while Iommi, outside of an offhanded remark or two, tended to take the high as a kite road... Oh my god. I think I know this bloke. He doesn't look too well though, does he really? It's all that booze, you know. Because he's the one that goes into Betty Ford Centre for two months and comes out and has a drink. Next. Dio, on the other hand, dropped the ether. We're still holding on to the dead dream. It's dead. Sabbaths are dead now. It's not that I don't like what they're doing. I mean, it's great music what they're doing, but it ain't Black Sabbath. It's not Black Sabbath. It's a new band. It's a different band. It doesn't sound remotely like Sabbath apart from Tony and Army's thundering riffs. Yeah. But actually, it's only till I left that I realised how, how much of a part of Sabbath I was, you know. Any of, any of the guys... You take four guys that have been together for as long as Sabbaths were, mm -hmm. and you try and... I mean, you, perhaps you would go away with a bass player or a drummer. But Tony and I only had his distinguished sound, and I had, his, I had my own sound in my own my, the style of singing. And that combination was Black Sabbath. I think he's right in that he's talking about uh, there is no more Black Sabbath uh, with Ozzy Osbourne in it. He's absolutely right. Not even remotely close as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I think that you'll find that the riffs that Tony are, Tony's playing now are probably uh, more musical riffs. And the reason probably being that he's now got... Uh, uh, someone who can uh, compare musically to the riffs that he's playing. This band is not the band that did Iron Man, that did War Pigs, because I don't sound like Ozzy, at least I hope I don't sound like Ozzy. It, he's right, it's not the same band, not at all the same band. It's a band that has progressed where Ozzy either refused to, pro pro to progress or was incapable of progression. Geezer Butler wrote all the lyrics to the songs that you've heard that have been hits. War Pigs, Paranoid, and right down the line, Iron Man, but yet Ozzy claims to have written the song. Not only does he claim at this point to have written the lyrics, he claims to have written the music. From 1969 through 1978, Ozzy was the driving force behind the demonic Black Sabbath. The break came because Ozzy felt held back creatively and needed a new outlet. Uh, I doubt very much that uh, Ozzy could carry a tune if you put a radio in a suitcase and gave it to him in his hand. I think that if Black Sabbath had just gone away and died, Ozzy wouldn't nearly be uh, enjoying the success he has now, and he sure as hell wouldn't be selling as much back catalog as all, all of them are getting, and I'm sure as hell not. I'm do doing Ozzy's job twice. Replying to them, to the things that Ozzy has said, to me is like dueling with an unarmed man. It really is. <laughs> 
I ain't about to mince words here. The mere fact that this is even a discussion is a testament to the immortal talent of Ronnie James Dio. These debates, without exception, fail to fucking exist if the second singer is an objective downgrade. In Dio's case, in both technique and songwriting bona fucking feeties, guess who is in fact an objective Upgrade! And while I acknowledge Ozzy often gets unfairly overlooked for his contributions lyrically, directionally, and even a fair few metallic melodies, invariably the merest utterance of this fact incites the Ozzy contingent to regurgitate the outright meaningless rejoinder, Well, Ozzy may not be better at belting out the tunes, just ask the guy behind the curtain singing for him these days, but he's better for Black Sabbath. Which, when you really break it down, is just a long-winded way of saying... I heard him first. Well, Wayne Shaft, throw yourself a fucking parade. I heard my mom sing Michael Jackson first in my fucking crib. That doesn't mean Meemaw gets to replace the King of Pop on the promotional circuit. And what definition of the word better are you employing precisely? Because it seems like whether it's Never Say Die, Technical Ecstasy, or Reunion efforts so often aborted they're looking into an endorsement deal from Planned Fucking Parenthood, the band's only semblance of security has come when Ozzy ain't allowed within 80 motherfucking miles of the metal icon in question. And given the well published publicized instances of strong-arming tour promoters into avoiding Sabbath in the mid-80s and early 90s lest they lose Aussie tours for the foreseeable future, or even going so far as to call venues to inform the fuckers Black Sabbath won't be able to make the show tonight, all of which Ozzy and Sharon admittedly engaged in in the late 80s, your definition of better seems about as stringent as Ozzy's definition of retirement tour. Look, Look no further than Mythos alumni accept for ready confirmation that sometimes Splitsville is right where a band should be. Some musical divorces benefit both parties. In the case of Accept, instead of one kick-ass metal band, they've now bifurcated into badass fucking twins. It's heavy metal mitosis, motherfuckers. So take a trek on down to that distant Native American village by the name of Quitcha Bitchin' and fall to your fucking knees that rivet heads of the 80s had Ozzy and Sabbath, in both creativity, production, trademark, ownership, branding, and the Black Sabbath sound. Whether you doff your dick at Dio, pay homage at the Shrine of Ozzy, fuck, whether it's Glenn Hughes, Ray Gillen, Ian Gillen, or Tony Martin that tickles your taint, bottom line, Dio ain't Sabbath, and Ozzy ain't either. I owe me is. Deal with it, douche canoes. Next. So I had all these things going through my head and pacing up and down the dressing room. Oh, God, it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. I just went to Tony and said, look, Tony, don't be, don't be nervous about this. If something goes wrong, they're not going to blame you. They're going to blame me. You know, I'm just always, always going to be my fault. I'm the guy who replaced Ozzy, remember? You're Tony Iommi. They're not going to blame you. They're going to blame me, so don't worry about it. He went, oh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> But all throughout the Heaven and Hell era, Ozzy had not been idle. Lacking in, shall we say, traditional musicality, the Howard Stern of heavy metal did what he does best. Compensate for his own inadequacies by arraying a rogues gallery of majestic talents to cover it the fuck up. Perennial bassist and songwriting secret weapon Bob Daisley, Uriah Heep legend Lee Kerslake, and a little fella by the name of Randy fucking Rhodes. And all this in response to this record right here. With a movie tie-in and seminal sci-fi animated feature fucking heavy metal no less. I think my bro was on the Heaven and Hell tour, wasn't it? Because we didn't we have to do it for that film. Oh, the actual track. Heavy Metal, yeah, well, the song, yeah, it was yeah, on the film right. soundtrack. Yeah, that's too. right. And we were actually on Heavy tour. Metal, right? The, yeah. The yeah. Cartoon. We were on tour. And we, did. we did a gig in London, and this is like the one in this song for Heavy Metal. We made right. a couple of days off, and um, I don't know how we ended up at John Lennon's house. And we set the drums up in the hallway of the of the house. To be honest, I really liked the sound we had in there. It was a great raw yeah. sound. Yeah. And we never used that. We never used that one on the album. That's interesting. I did not. So, so there are two of the song mob rules yeah, there are true. two different recordings of it completely different recordings and that the one at on the heavy metal soundtrack was recorded at john lennon's house yeah <laughs> mob rules was every bit the success of its forebear but musically in my eyes it at least somewhat 
tops it. Admittedly more piecemeal than its predecessor in terms of consistency, I'd argue the peaks top out incrementally higher than Heaven and Hell. But let's be real here, bitches, these are two separate stellar releases in their own right, and atop the heap for me at least is the black magic metal of Voodoo. But we all know what happened next, not least of which because Sabbath themselves apprised us of the fact. On the ensuing tour, efforts were made for the first proper Dio-fronted live album, Live Evil. And that's where shit went pear-shaped. With Bill Ward departing ahead of the new record, that left Ronnie James Dio and fellow American replacement drummer Vinny Appice an all-but-self-sustaining unit within said band. I can function, period. My health was worsening with the alcoholism and uh, I I couldn't believe in that Sabbath. As such the band bisected along lines of nationality not to mention drug choice of course. That I, I believe that after that album um, Tony and Geezer probably had some other agendas. Okay. Um, what they were I never really asked even when we got back together again but I know that they had other agendas and there was there were a lot of uh, a lot of drugs going around at that time. Oh, okay. You know, Vinny and I weren't that. We weren't drugged out. We, we didn't, don't, don't, don't do that. But, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of that going on in, in parts of the camp. Iommi and Butler, upper-fueled fuckbags that they were at the time, would turn in no earlier than 8 o'clock, coke fumes doubtless billowing about them, while the RV connection would turn up when the sun was still out. And so Iommi would listen to each new mix, only to discover that in his absence, well... The engineer who was uh, doing the product um, was drinking a lot, and he would tell Tony and Geezer that Vinny and I were going into the studio and turning up the drums and the vocals. We're going the next day, and what the hell's happened to the guitar and bass? And the engineer, oh, well, Ronnie changed it all, he brought all the vocals up more. <laughs> Emotionally, and from working such a long time and touring for the three years or so, and, and recording two albums back to back within a four year period. It just got a little bit too much for all of us to take. I couldn't understand why they would listen to an, an idiot who was drinking a bottle of Jack Daniels every day. You know, it made no sense to me. So, he came next up with Ben Ronnie from his studio. He wouldn't let him come in, you see, and that's, of course, that's when, it all, that's when that, that was the final straw. It just, it just broke up. Worse still, they aired every bit of this bullshit in the press, dramatically dropping public stock in the band while they were still in the midst of a mid-career resurgence. It was all well and good as it happened, as the band's label Warner Brothers had already signed Ronnie to a five-album solo deal with a little project called Dio. But once again, a story for another mythos. Aberrant impulse, not to mention a clash of chemicals, had once again led Black Sabbath to a career crossroads. And Tony Iommi was about to hang a hard fucking left. Here with us tonight, Tony Iommi, longtime member of the band. Geezer Butler. Hello there. Hello. <laughs> and brand new member, Ian Gillen. Hello. We were doing a show with Gillen and Black Sabbath, quite a lot of bands in Frankfurt, and uh, Ozzy came in weeping on my shoulder, said, I wish I could do what you did. And I said, what's that? And he said, have the guts to leave Black Sabbath. And he said, I've got this nightmare, I'm going to be singing Paranoid when I'm about 90. And if, I, if I'd known then what I know now, I'd have said, well, don't worry, I'll do it for you. I said, <laughs> so here's a fucking weird one. Dio having fucked off to Middle Earth and Ozzy by now barking at the moon. Black Sabbath, we're seriously fucked, with Metal Mag's exhaustively cataloging every spasm in the band's prolonged self-destruction, it was at last the label who next intervened. Metal Legend alleges that the management had a simple plan. Ian Gillen of Deep Purple fame needs a band, Black Sabbath needs a singer, let's spend 15 seconds MS painting some fucking horns on a baby, slap it on a cover, and call it a band! In actuality, it was infinitely more personal than that. Ozzy had by now broken it off with his ex-wife and was shacking up with Sharon Arden, legendary manager Don Arden's daughter, and yes, that would be the Sharon Osbourne we all know and... will know anyway. After which, Ozzy broke away from Don Arden's management and used his daughter instead in... 
many different ways. In short, Born Again was a failed fucking revenge plot. A callous attempt by Don Arden to hotshot Black Sabbath back to prominence as a righteous fuck you to his daughter and son-in-law by pairing them with the hottest heavy metal free agent on the planet, Ian Gillen. I was impressed by their attitudes, their sort of hunger and drive and belief in what they were still doing after all these years. Also, we have the same uh, habits. The same <laughs> habits. Habits. What kinds of habits? Drinking habits. And I went along to meet Tony and Geezer in a pub somewhere in the Midlands, and by the time we got thrown out, I found I was a member of Black Sabbath. I think after about two hours, the meeting was adjourned to under the table. <laughs> <laughs> so you knew these were to be fair, Gillen was hot shit in classic Deep Purple, but by the early 80s, after a solo venture that started strong, his career had by now cooled considerably and was arcing toward an outright deep freeze. Now here's where I admit... I just don't get the Gillen thing. Never have. Probably never will. Robert Plant? Get it. Halford? Get it. Ozzy? Not my favorite, but I got him. Get it. Fuck. I even acknowledge one of these three men was fucking inspired by Ian Gillen. But every time I saddle up and endure another exhibition in Ian Gillen's nasally mewling, I don't know whether to headbang or hand him a handkerchief. I get that he's lost his pipes. Fuck, he arguably lost them during this period specifically. But even in his prime, I'd rather listen to literally any other Deep Purple from man. Rod Evans, Glenn Hughes, fuck, I'd rather watch Jolyn Turner pluck his wigs, and I'd prefer each and every one of them in Black fucking Sabbath. I just don't get Gillen. He screams. Neat! So does Halford, and he's better at it. Next. But one gonzo goddamn drinking session later, and Ian Gillen was suddenly in Sabbath. On the plus side, Bill Ward was back from the booze tank for 15 seconds, meaning three-fourths of fucking Sabbath would waste their creative energy behind a subpar singer. Having said all that, born again? Still pretty boss. Some solid tunes prop the proceedings up like Rebar from the opening strains of Trash, which is damn near an autobiography for a period Ian Gillen has since described as, quote, the longest party of my entire life, to the final refrains of Doom Metal Leviathan, keep it warm. The production may be nearly as sketchy as the fucking cover art, but let that not dissuade you from dropping the needle on Black Sabbath Born Again. There's a bottomless wellspring of second look studs here for a fucking fact. Some chundering chode calls this a bad album, brah. Kindly point out it was good enough for Guns N' Roses to rip the fuck off. <laughs> and the Beastie Boys. Check it! know the stories, Digital Bitch supposedly being a dig at Sharon Osbourne, which isn't true for the record, Gill and Gank in a golf cart riding all around Merry England, ultimately inspiring Trashed, and where would the world be without Stonehenge, the song that inspired the stage set that inspired Spinal Tap. Somebody said, anyone got an idea of what we should do as a stage set? Giza said, Stonehenge. And the guy said, well, how do you envisage this? And he said, life size. So they produced a life-size Stonehenge. Stonehenge came down. It's three times bigger than the original Stonehenge. We had to hire the NEC <laughs> for rehearsals. It's the only place where it would fit. And that, <laughs> and that is without the stage. The dimensions that the management company had given were in feet. And the manager, by the time he did it in metres, so it was like three times bigger than what it was. <laughs> it was massive. And we're looking up at this thing going, bloody hell, what are we going to do with this? And then Spinal Tap came out, who just happened to have the tiny Stonehenge. The little children of Stonehenge, beneath the haunted moon. Look, there's nothing wrong with a grab for commercial revival. Where the warning lights start flashing is when it's an inorganic attempt to hotshot back to glory. After all, the only thing worse than a bad record nobody buys is one the management makes sure 
everyone hears, and such was the case with Born Again. In retrospect, Sabbath could likely thank the Born Again album for audiences never giving any of the goddamn exceptional material they'd crank out in the latter half of the decade a single spin. They'd simply burn the fans too fucking hard with this record. Iommi and Ian Gillen were having the time of their lives, much to the bafflement of the Black Sabbath faithful, but if you thought it couldn't get any weirder, strap the fuck in, it's about to get bowling shoe ugly. Why do you think there has been so many different band lineup changes in Sabbath? <laughs> now you're the only original member of the band left now. Do you feel like you're kind of, uh, if you will, carrying the cross yourself? Oh yeah. <laughs> This is gonna be a big one, because I could almost dedicate an entire video solely to the seventh star, as it happens to be both fascinating and my personal favorite Sabbath album. After the Born Again Afterbirth, Iommi auditioned every spray tan singing sensation in the greater LA area, up to and including a Christian televangelist, Jeff Fenhold, who recorded damn near the full album, which was later bootlegged as Star of India. <laughs> And so, after an aborted Aussie reunion attempt culminating in a performance at Live Aid, he gradually warmed to an alternate idea. A solo record with a bevy of badass rock royalty behind the microphone. But I, w I wanted to break away and do a solo project under Tony Iommi, which I did, um, called the Seven Star Album. But of course, as it went on, Tom went on, Black Sabbath was still supposed to have owed Warner Brothers another album, so they nabbed that one to become a Black Sabbath album. There's people saying it doesn't sound like Black Sabbath and it's not a Black Sabbath. Because it wasn't a Black Sabbath album, it was a, a solo project which became a Black Sabbath album. Now this wasn't quite the case, but we'll get to that in a moment. The names? Robert Plant, David Coverdale, Rob Halford. But when Deep Purple's former bassist and should have been lead fucking singer, the great Glenn Hughes lit up the microphone, it was all she wrote. And Hughes was the man. It also helped that the record companies wouldn't let Halford or Plant out of their fucking contracts. Now, Hughes is often depicted as an outsider in the Sabbath stable, but nothing could be further from the truth. Not only had his early exceptional band Trapeze toured with the original incarnation of Sabbath, he was sharing a house with Ozzy Osbourne when the original Blizzard of Oz band was fucking formed, and we all know what happened next. Warner Brothers smacked a Sabbath logo on the cover because, bitch, that's what sells. And so to Glenn Hughes's horror, he had joined Black Sabbath without ever actually auditioning for it. And the, the record was done and um, did a video for it. And then his managers and Warners thought, well, you know, we could should call this Black Sabbath. It was just a bunch of bullshit. Or had he? While it's often cast by the Obliviati on Metal Archives as a Tony Iommi solo album with Sabbath slapped on the sleeve in truth, that assertion fails to survive a solitary playing of the Cyclopean Sabbath standard, Seventh Star. <laughs> sound like the Sabbathy doomcraft Iomi been crafting for the preceding decade and a goddamn half? Your ear canal's in dire need of a roto rooter reach around. The lion's share of the complaints, in fact, appear to center around the bluesier melodic refrains that characterize some of the album's outliers. And while I concede that the haunting No Stranger to Love is just this side of monster ballad territory for the most part, this album is balls deep in blues metal. We're into this very sort of classic rock melodic thing uh, with extremely heavy riffs. Uh, the difference between, I guess, myself and Ozzy or Dio is, 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 is that I wanted a, a different spin on, on what Tony was writing on the music rather than uh, maybe singing in a, uh, you know, aggressive voice. I wanted it to spin off into something a little bit more melodic and soulful. So here we have what we what I consider to be a very melodic album for, from Tony and Glenn. I'm going to blow some minds here, but Ozzy... 
Not really a metal singer as such. So what is it, you ask? Well... I'm glad you inquired, amorphous fuck-knob on the internet. Let's dissect. From his throaty bellow, to his occasional melismatic note-bending, to the improvisational supplications to God and Jesus in the early Black Sabbath material, Ozzy Osbourne is, and always has been, a BLUES singer! For fuck's sake, listen to the music, and this time, open your ears! Poisoning their brainwashed minds Oh, Lord, yeah. There's even some gospel in there, goddammit! So the crux of these cocksuckers' argument appears to be that Seven Star Era Sabbath isn't Sabbath because Glenn Hughes is the exact same kind of singer as Ozzy, but better at it? Of all the shit to shriek about, blues doesn't belong in Black Sabbath. Blues! Well, there's a world-rending assertion. I think you're on to something there, Jimmy Neutron, but for one minuscule motherfucking detail. Sabbath? started as a butt-fucking blues band. 90% of my homies' riffs are just down-tuned blues scales fed through a fucking fuzz pedal. It was all 12-bar blues. It's like we, every Tuesday night we go to this place and just, you know, like dry our hair long and, you know, and just have a couple of pints, you know, and, and just, just do 12-bar blues, you know. Blow me, bitch! Seven Star is Sabbath. It's just Sabbath with a slightly more generous slathering of blues and soul than usual. Fuck the aforementioned Jeff Fenholt further demolishes this fallacious narrative by stating that when he cut the Star of India demos, before Glenn Hughes' involvement, mind you, it was already being called Black Sabbath. Casting further doubt on the solo project allegation, Tony Iommi bought the rights to the Black Sabbath name and trademark ahead of the album's release in 86. Why would you buy millions of dollars worth of Black Sabbath trademarks if you weren't planning on using them? Oops, time to correct those Wikipedia articles, kiddies. Either way, given subsequent side projects from Iommi and Hughes, I ain't gonna lie. I'd happily replace some of the latter-day Heaven and Hell or Sabbath output with another proper crack at the Hughes incarnation of the butt-fucking band. But by the time Tony took Glenn out on the road, his addiction to coke and, well, coke was working his rapidly ballooning backside like a pommel horse. Actually, that's not fair. As contrary to popular belief, Glenn Hughes was as sober as he ever really got in 86, thanks to some serious Black Sabbath babysitting from Iommi's management. Doug Goldstein was hired as a security guy to literally be with me 24-7, adjoining rooms. He, he, he had a thread on the knob on the door if I left the room. So I couldn't do any drugs, but I could drink a little bit. Was it would, possible to keep him away from drinking drugs? No, I don't think he could keep anybody away from anything if they really wanted to do it. We put a 24-hour bodyguard with him to watch him 24 hours. And this, this guy slept in the next room, we had into joining rooms. Um, we put things on his door, so if he come out of his door, we'd know he's gone out, just to make sure he's OK, you know? Yeah. Because he did have a habit of just disappearing and, you know, you, you don't know if he's going to come back. Point being, his habits had effectively fucking destroyed the man accurately dubbed the voice of rock when a chance altercation with a production manager on the tour at a hotel elevator handed Hughes a broken beak, secured his whiskey-soaked stupor he thought nothing of it at the time. And then he tried to sing live. And this shit came out. <laughs> We took him out into the first week of the tour, first 10 days or whatever it was. Um, Glenn was, uh, he was just in bits, he, his vocals, he just couldn't sing. People were just knocking me because they just thought I was loaded, which I wasn't doing drugs on that tour, but I was drinking heavily. Um, he sort of pops up on so many people's albums though, Tony, doesn't he? He does a bit and then they fire him. Well, that's right. I think album-wise he's fine, uh, but when he gets onto the road it's, uh, it's another story really, yeah. which we found out. <laughs> Different sort of animal. Yeah, I was warned though by various other people he's been with, you know. Yeah. But, uh, there we go. You know, I was overserved at the bar, if you will, and uh, I got into a bit of a fracas with the production manager, and he decided to take a swing at me, knock me clean out, but he broke this bone here that went into my nasal cavity, and 
a blood went into my throat and oh. and, and they, they they did a a, a check on my on my nose and throat and I it was caked with dried blood. Oh. You know, we should have known at Meadowlands people were going, "Well, Glenn can't even talk." Enter Ray Gillen, perhaps one of the greatest all-time unknowns of the 80s and 90s. Gillen stepped to the mic stand and savaged the remainder of the tour. While Tony Hannock used perhaps the single most disrespectful sacking in metal history, Glenn only wising up to his replacement when Ray Gillen literally fucking sauntered in the goddamn door. Class move, Tony. <laughs> the funny thing is, this is weird, but it's, it's a laugh now to me, but... I didn't do a sound check at the Meadowlands because Ray Gillum was like rehearsing with them. Ah, you know, your, I'm your replacement. Love because Ray was a good friend yeah. of mine. I was in a room after the pop, after the show, and and somebody, I heard somebody talking about the new singer to replace Glenn. And my ears went, "Hello." <laughs> Yet what Iommi was sadly oblivious to, and depending on who you believe, possibly Gillen as well, was that his newfound frontman was already living with a death sentence, a case of full-blown AIDS that would go undiagnosed, despite Ray being visibly symptomatic as early as 88, and fucking every groupie in sight regoddamn guardless. But more on that when I cover Badlands. Hughes was out, Gillen was in, yet what remained on record store shelves was this incredible, impossibly underrated album. My personal favorite of their fucking career, in fact. It ain't the Ozzy era, and it also wasn't trying to be. Best track, no contest, the semi-autobiographical assault of Danger Zone. Don't try to stop me, just leave me on my own. Kenny Loggins, eat your mullabedecked bonds out. Seventh star is seven kinds of kick-ass. Next! 77 to 91 was a dark place. And again, I do not remember the 80s. The good news, new singer Ray Gillen did finally take an AIDS test. The bad news, he crammed for it vociferously, fucking many a wide-eyed American groupie along the way, setting up what would become the victims of Ray Gillen in the litigative aftermath. Ever wonder why no post-2010 re-releases of this album include the Ray Gillen tracks? Ever wonder why the entire Badlands catalog did a dive bomb into a fucking memory hole? And I was told that they, the reason they were given is because Ray was very sick, and in the end, he... You know, he died of AIDS and he infected some women, and it was as a concession to the families that were impacted by this. It, they were told those records won't be on shelves anymore. I've heard For that, some, I, but some. I don't understand how that helps them exactly. in any way. If anything, propose that Ray's share goes towards them. Now you know! Don't dig it? Maybe you should worship a singer that doesn't kill bitches with his caca keg crank. But I'll be upfront about this. Dong that doubles as a heat-seeking hiv torpedo or not. As great as Gillen's golden pipes were, Tony Martin, the man who would replace him after an utterly idiotic departure, kinda fucking smokes him regardless. Rise up! Hello, the band's brand new singer, Mr. Tony Martin. Whatcha? How you doing, guys? All right. Well, uh, uh, Tony, let me begin by clarifying exactly who is in Black Sabbath at the moment, because the last time we heard from the band was the, the Seventh Star album. There seemed to be... Well, I, I, to be honest with you, I got completely confused. I didn't know who was in the band in the end. Who's in the you band? You got confused. Yeah. <laughs> they kept calling me back. I mean, the first call I got for Black Sabbath was when Glenn Hughes was in the band at the Seventh Star album. And I was put on hold because I was having problems with Glenn. Ray Gillen uh, disappeared um, and they needed a singer. And then I got the audition and went, I got the job. What's more, as Tony would soon discover, Gillen couldn't write songs for shit. But Tony Martin 
could. Sure, he looks like a wood elf from Oblivion. Sure, he has the hairline of Count Von Kaut. But break it down musically and Martin has more feel, tighter vibrato, less raps. Tony Martin is the titties, which gives him something in common with this fucking album. The Eternal Idol turned out to be a sorely as needed assertion of Sabbath stability, establishing the framework for what would be the band's most consistent lineup of the decade, which considering Iommi spent the entirety of the 80s snorting half the coke crop in Colombia is no mean feat and fuck indeed. Energetic. Darksome. And Aussie fan fucks, how does it feel knowing quite possibly the single doomiest track in the entire Sabbath catalog was sung not by the Prince of Narkness, but by Tony Martin, the man Sharon Osbourne gave the MIB memory wipe out of official Black Sabbath canon ever since the ill-fated fucking reunion. The original members of Black Sabbath got together to perform two concerts in Birmingham, England, and record the first ever live Sabbath album. This is the first official live album that we've ever done. Kids have always been asking us for, like, a, an official live album. While the Eternal Idol isn't the finest of the forthcoming Martin era, a slouch it fucking ain't, Ancient Warrior, The Shining. While much of the so-called classic Sabbath material gets weaker the more the radio rides its dope-smoking dick, the Eternal Idol gets better the deeper you go. Fuck, Lost Forever ain't until track eight, and it fucking savages. But for me, it's the occasional experiments with power metal that ripped the hardest, as evidenced by an ode to all things metallic and masculine, Glory Ride. With the Seven Star, this ain't Iommi's solo project. It ain't a tribute band, and it certainly isn't shit. The Eternal Idol was a soft reboot for Black Fucking Sabbath. Full stop. And the fact that Ozzy's postmenopausal managerial maven is still insisting these do not in fact exist is a laugh and a goddamn half. But here's the hilarious bit. As great as this goddamn is, the Martin manifestation of the band had yet to hit its stride. But oh, it didn't take long for Black Sabbath to do precisely that. After all the, the rubbish we went through from the Eternal Idol album, I signed with a new management. We decided to say we need a, you know, a, a good name band, new, name musicians for credibility, build the credibility on. This is uh, Cozy Powell from Black Sabbath. Yeah, and I'm Tony Iommi. I mean, it's a great honor to come in and play for Sabbath. And I'm looking forward to this tour because I think it's going to be the best lineup that Sabbath have ever had. We got uh, Neil Murray, which is a bass player that I used to work with before. He came involved, and uh, Jeff Nichols did some keyboard work on the album. So we, we pulled the thing together from a very shaky start. Headless Cross, you probably know most of it. Yeah, I saw an interview with you, Antonio, on MTV. You talked about that. Uh, yeah, Headless Cross is a place. The village and stuff. That's right, where we used to live. I used to live there. Mm. Wiped out by the plague a few hundred years ago. Mm. I've said it before, I repeat for posterity. Do not sleep on the Tony Martin era of Black Sabbath. If you do, you miss out on more than the latter-day dog shit Tony cranked out to fulfill fucking contractual obligations. You unwittingly rob yourself of your very first encounter with this beast of a record right here. Say what you want about the Martin era. Headless Cross is one of the band's finest albums, and by that I mean top fucking five. Ever. And I assert this with every awareness. Dimming the lights, darkening the lyrics, and upping the atmospherics in equal measure, Headless Cross asserts a new identity for the band, both visually and musically, in an era where they couldn't get arrested in America, and every ink-stained shit stain in the music press would sooner write Iommi's obituary than review his fucking records. In short, it's Black Sabbath's late 80s answer to heaven and hell, and even up against that colossus, it holds its ground and doesn't budge the beginning beginnings of an inch. Hmm, yet another 
another yarn about a demonic woman in a position of power immediately after rumors of Sharon Osbourne freezing the band out of major tours by threatening promoters that they'd have no access to Ozzy in the aftermath. You know, I can't imagine who that might be about! And after endless flirtations stretching all the way back to heaven and hell sessions, having finally recruited perhaps the finest drummer in metal, Cozy Powell, and even allowing him to co-produce... If it was musical credibility Iommi was after, he had exactly the band to do it. When we, uh, Tony and I got together initially, I, I got a few ideas of scratched together on one tape, and I went up to Tony's house, and he said, uh, oh, you want some riffs? And he, he went into the cupboard and pulled out four bags, uh, f you know, uh, the shopping bags, full of cassettes, <laughs> and there must have been uh, about 30 or 40 riffs on each cassette. So, I, 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 I mean, I reckon he should open the shop. <laughs> riffs for sale, proprietor yeah. Tony Iommi. <laughs> this album is utterly merciless. Black Moon, Nightwing, Headless Cross, but one of the album's immortal standouts comes only when you perk an ear to the midsection of moody doom metal masterpiece When Death Calls for the familiar guitar strains of one Brian May, yes, of Metal Mythos Luminaries, Queen. He's been a good friend for 20 years, and so uh, I think it's about time we had a... Um, I've never had another guitar player play on Sabbath album before, so it's, uh, it's quite a... Dare, Tony, it's quite right. a first now, it's... Um, but he's one chap who's a definite exception, and... Um, I'm glad he did. Great player. Yeah, Great player. good solo as well. Queen meets Sabbath. If that don't send you screaming to the record store to hunt down Headless Cross, I don't know what the fuck will. Metal masterpiece. Get it, goddammit! Many people, when they think of Sabbath, have got a definitive idea in their head what Sabbath means to them. You have to have the ultimate goal, which is what Sabbath is all about. And that's really what we're trying to do to continue the, the story. Where the story will end, my guess is as good as anybody else's. <laughs> Ballsy attempt to craft a credibility record, but sadly, thanks to a music press that vacillated from indifference to outright acrimony, Iommi's luck was no better than with Lita Ford. Uh, what can you say, really? Can I have my ring back? <laughs> <laughs> listen to Heaven and Hell, Mob Rules, or Rainbow and said to yourself, you know, I bet if Ronnie stayed in Sabbath, they would have eventually explored some full-blown Frodo in the Ring fucking power metal. Congratulations! Your collective curiosity willed that album into existence, and its name is Tear, the logical power metal progression from the atramentous atmospherics of Headless Cross, and arguably its musical equal as well. If it suffers in any single respect, it's once again with the wonky choice of singles. Look, this ain't hard, IRS Records. First single, Rocker. Second single, Ballad. Warrant, Winger, and Rat got this down to a finely honed fucking science and printed more money than the Obama administration. Maybe you should try it sometime. Because leading with a ballad, particularly for a band like Black Sabbath, makes the fanboys think we're in for a fruity-ass monster ballad showcase with Black Sabbath. Which resoundingly is not the case with Tear. This record... Rips and it rips immediately. To the thunder, life for blame. What you do have here, however, is more light and shade than traditional 80s Sabbath stuff. Plenty of slow acoustic buildups, followed by orgasmic metallic payoffs. It ain't the most commercial formula, and if Tear has one Achilles heel, it was that. No immediately apparent metallic single. Damn near everything's an epic. Jerusalem, the Norse mythology trilogy of the Battle of Tear, Odin's Court, and Valhalla. Even the ballad has a bit of a buildup here, but no matter how ponderous the acoustic bullshit could be at times, when I Naomi tears into the inevitable payoff riff. It donkey punches you flush in the fucking Sabbath stones. Unfairly ignored at release after all the 90s had by now already dawned, 
Tyr has since proven the ideal sonic capstone to a titanic triumvirate in the late 80s Tony Martin era. It really is that goddamn good. It's just a shame none of that translated into relevance, or for that matter, sales, because we may have avoided the goat fuck that happened next. But we worked pretty good, I thought, and I, I managed to get the, the band into a, you know, a, a sort of position from being actually quite low. It was difficult for people to work with them at the time. Um, they was kind of getting made, having jokes made about them because they had so many singers. But we built it up, and I thought we were doing pretty good. Tony Martin's admirable efforts, Sabbath had struggled through the late 80s, suffering a constant procession of touring, record company, and lineup reversals on a bi-monthly basis. Soldiering through it all was Tony Iommi. That is, of course, until Geezer Butler began feeling nostalgic. Cutting the No Rest for the Wicked record with Ozzy, it wasn't long before his path crossed with Ronnie James Dio. And Geezer came to the show, and I told him he couldn't come to the show unless he brought his bass, because he had to play. So he said, okay. So he brought his bass, which got lost on the air airplane, of course. So he had to borrow another one, but he did play. Well, at the beginning, if you were taking notes on Georgia, we had surprises. We had a cupola that blew up. We had everything else that lit on fire. Bars that swing out and do all these other wonderful things. But uh, for me, it is a better surprise. I hope you enjoy it as well. It's been eight years since I've played with this uh, particular gentleman, who is, in my estimation, the greatest rock and roll bass player on the face of the earth. Always was, always will be. We were in a band together one time called Black Sabbath, and I should like to bring him on here now for you. <laughs> my friend, he's a butler. He's a And just from that beginning, I mean, it was, it was wonderful. It was like we'd play together forever. With their feet already wet, it wasn't long before the boys were back together, commiserating about the bizarre collapse of the Dio-era Black Sabbath band in 82, resulting in, you guessed it, a full-blown fucking reunion. And why not? Within a year or two of the split, both sides were already fairly philosophical on the subject. Maybe our success or our attitude about how important we were was maybe perhaps a little bit wrong. Uh, proves now again that the strength was always in the numbers. The strength was in the fact that we did what we did together. Now, it wasn't quite what it appeared in retrospect, but by now, we were admittedly up to our nuts in the 90s, and Ronnie's Gandalf medal was decidedly passe. But let's face it, folks, Ronnie James Dio was a glorious goddamn geek, and so by way of replacement, he exchanged the Sauron slang for science fiction, exploring lyrical themes of cyborgs and cyberspace in their stead. The computer says man's a mistake, so we'll fix it. And let's hope that uh, we're, we're not around when they want to fix us. Uh, and it speaks of things to come, if, if not things that are, uh, that are already. <laughs> motif the metal magician would carry forward into Dio itself on Angry Machines later in the decade, but the Dio reunion wasn't without its awkwardness. You see, for all Tony Martin knew, he was still Sabbath's singer, only receiving the Dear John call literally the day he set out for the studio. Well, the first time they did that was a, a big shock, because um, I was actually walking out the door to go to rehearsals when the first time that happened, um, and nobody told me, so I was like, oh, get out. Couldn't they have just sort of called me up or something, you know, and sort of said something about it? But they're the sort of people they don't talk to you face, and it's always been that way. They you have to read between the lines pretty much with Sabbath, and you hear from somebody else. For the longest time, it was impossible to speculate how far into the project Tony Martin truly was, but with the advent of the internet, we soon discovered the answer. Intimately. Now you might know that, but here's the part you probably don't know. Tony Martin was not only involved in Dehumanizer, he was never truly fired. Dio and Sabbath, to put it bluntly, still didn't trust each other for fucking shit. We went to the States to do some rehearsals and it didn't particularly gel the first, first couple of months. It, the, the, the chemistry wasn't quite right. 
for whatever reason. Again, the communication problem came up again. We didn't really communicate. So when any problems did come up, you know, it was a matter of people hiding behind doors and you know, hearing it from other people. This is wrong. That's a problem. Went down to a horse show just near where I live, and I had a horse promptly fall on top of me, breaking my pelvis, and that was me out of the band. And that's when we got Vinnie back. And once Vinnie was back, Ronnie felt comfortable. So then he was started being able to write. But it still took it. was still pulling teeth doing that album. Dio going so far as refusing to reveal his vocal melodies for months, they phoned up Mr. Martin, who came in to record a full version of Dehumanizer. You know, Iomi, now that you got a little time on your hands, maybe finish up those remasters and include a Tony Martin bonus disc. Just a girl with a dream. Sadly, Warner Brothers soon discovered the deception, ordering the Martin tracks to be shit-canned, and worse still, they tattled the Tony Martin's record label, Polydor, who by way of penalty refused to release his first solo album in America. An album that included an all-star cast, Brian May, Cozy Powell, and even Ringo Starr's son, Zach Starkey. Ever wonder why Tony Martin remains obscure as shit here? Wonder no longer. And in retrospect, perhaps that contributes to the slight incongruity here. Dehumanizer is a heathen beast for a fact, but it's not heaven and hell and shit, it ain't even mob rules. And now we know why. It was never really Ronnie's album. Not that it stopped him from stamping that D.O. identity from toes to titties. Dehumanizer caught more shit than Archie Bradley's underoos. It was clouded over when we done it, because it was probably the wrong time when we did it, and you know that, that, that sort of music wasn't, so, so, quite, you know, lost a bit of popularity, I suppose. But suddenly it's come back. In the years to follow, it's been reassessed as being just this side of an excellent exploration of Sabbath's sci-fi side. But the love in, sadly, was not to last. I've always found that really was the Sabbath way. It really was. If there wasn't a problem, one would be created. And fix it, not a chance. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our Dio. Look! I adore Ronnie, but if history has taught us anything, it's the Dio equals drama. He's perhaps the penultimate metal icon, but let's all be honest here. Ronnie could be a little precious at times. And so, as Sabbath were offered a laughable gig opening for Ozzy, who was by now balls deep in radio rock retardation, Dio declared, as diplomatically as humanly possible, BLOW IT OUT YOUR EVER LOVING ASS! Well, I knew this was over from the beginning, you know, I mean, this tour was only gonna last until we got to Los Angeles because it was, had been mentioned, not mentioned, but told to me that we were now going to not be doing this tour as our own tour all the way through it. But when we got to Los Angeles, we were gonna open for Ozzy. Mm -hmm. I especially gave up too much of what I had with the Dio band uh, to suddenly be relegated to being the opening act for uh, the ex-lead singer, again, who had nothing but bad things to say, certainly about me, but about Tony as well, and Geezer, so just wasn't in the cards, I wasn't going to be on the same stage with a man. And you all know the rest. The last minute replacement by Rob Halford in a rare priest meets Sabbath scenario that probably sounded better on paper than it was in person. <laughs> Maybe that's why talks of having Halford enter the Black Sabbath camp afterward broke down ultimately. Yes, that actually happened, by the way. But really, can you blame Ronnie? Not only had Ozzy never missed an opportunity to pinch a log on Lord Dio, this is the same cat who hired a dwarf for the sole purpose of parodying his diminutive replacement on tour, who tirelessly excoriated the second incarnation of Sabbath as illegitimate, even as he attempted to re-record their classic material as a final fuck you, and worse still, the fans fucking loved it! The more bitter Ozzy got, the more money he wiped his lily-white ass with. It's a rare case where the fans are frankly as much to blame for the ongoing Sabbath hostilities over the years as they were actively rewarding Ozzy's autism. Anticipating an Ozzy reunion, Ronnie was out, and sure enough, Tony bit. And that's when Sharon Osbourne bit back. And then they announced that they were going to have a reunion. 
Well, that would have meant that it wouldn't be any band with me in it anyway, or, or Vinny, so I guess I did the right thing. And then not too long after that, Ozzy decided, no, I don't want to do this. So let's face it, it all comes down to the fact that someone wanted to break this band up, and they did a very good job of it. Back in the old days with Ozzy, yes, we had some great times, but we also had a lot of problems, and, uh, the, the, you know, the, when it gets to a stage where you, you've got certainly like now where Ozzy's had his own band and Guy's had his and other than mine it's difficult when you all try and bring a unit back together that you wouldn't had because you've all changed so much since then we were on a bus just like this they stayed in the back and I stayed in the front sorry I didn't want to do that but that's the way they chose to do it so you know next time if you get a chance to talk to them don't let them bullshit you. don't let them say no oh, I don't want to talk about it ask them the real questions did you really talk about that well the answer is no and then play them that next time so I could talk to you guys, you never talked about it, did you? And you blew well, the best band there ever could have been on the face of the earth, you stupid assholes. And so like a bolt from the black, Tony Martin's phone rang once more, for a third time, mind you, as he'd not only recorded Dehumanizer, but had been called in to fill in for Dio instead of Halford, only to be informed at the 11th hour that if he showed, he would be arrested! Okay? On the plus side, when the Dehumanizer sessions Tony Martin had recorded were shelved, the band, quietly cognizant that Dio was not about to work out here, began work on the music that would ultimately become Cross Purposes. Yes, this album dates back to 1992, meaning technically there were two Black Sabbaths for a bit. Did I mention Dio spells drama? With Vinny departing alongside Dio, Quiet Riot's Bobby Rondinelli filled the vacant drum stool while Geezer Butler remained to record his one and only Black Sabbath album with Tony Martin. The result? The apropos appellation, Cross Purposes, a more down-paced progression for the mythological metal of Tear with a generous dollop of doom metal and AOR. Cross Purposes is a criminally underrated album in the Black Sabbath catalog and in my eyes comprises a bit of a creative rebound after the somewhat staid dehumanizer. More organic, more inspired and catchier on the whole, Iomi alleged it was easier to write as well. I think we've gone as far as we could go with that lineup. It wasn't... It it took like two years, over a period of two years, to do that last album with him. So what we've got now is is uh, is the best thing we've got. You know, it's, it's easy to we can work. We've got a great relationship, and uh, music comes easy. You know, it wasn't coming that easy with with Ronnie. Stolen Scorpions cover art or not, Cross Purposes kicks new and exciting shapes and consistencies of ass, as encapsulated by the opening assault, Eyewitness. Of the burning dark, darkness which illuminates you. And yes, once again, the lyrics were inspired by a movie, like The Shining before it, an infanticide symphony, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, on the very same album, a song that was inspired by a movie, inspired by a case you may catch an Investigation Discovery special about on occasion, wherein a nurse made herself one of the most prolific serial killers in American history by slowly poisoning defenseless infants. No light in these eyes No place for dreams at all Tony Martin, proving all you need to be in Black Sabbath is a singing voice and a blockbuster card. Look, it ain't all excellent, though, particularly as the pace begins to drag near the second half where doom gives way to dog shit via dying for love. It's getting closer, change is bound to come. There's so Look, it's still listenable, but a far cry from killers like Cross of Thorns and the epic album closer Evil Eye. It ain't easy to find in a post ozzy reunion era where we all pretend 15 years of Black Sabbath history up and swan dove into a fucking memory hole, but if you see it, buy it! Next! Uh, Geezer and myself had a disagreement, and um, so, you know, that, that band sort of disintegrated. And um, so immediately I, I wanted you know, to get onto Cozy and, and Neil and um, and get that lineup back because that lineup was a, a great working lineup. We all work well. We have a great relationship with each other. So I phoned everybody up, and they says no. <laughs> Depending 
on who you ask, 1995's Forbidden is either the worst or the worstest Sabbath offering, full stop. I'm not so sure I'd go quite that far, as the deeper you dig, the better some of the sleeper songs get. Look, there's no pretty way of putting this. Forbidden at its best is almost as kick-ass as many of the better moments on Cross Purposes. But by the same token, at its worst, Forbidden is so bad not even Tony Martin's hair wants to be a part of this album. Caught in a complex catacomb of your own inadequacies and pitiful weaknesses. Your soul secretes insecurity, so you live on the reflection side of the Ice-T Black Sabbath rap rock collaboration Illusion of Power was massively misguided. Nothing against Ice-T, as body count readily attests, he's a big time Black Sabbath fan actually, but a crossover this delicate requires a deft touch, and neither Iomi or Ice-T appear to possess it here. And it's a shame because public enemy aren't metal fans at all, yet somehow made the Anthrax thing fucking work. Ditto for Run, DMC, and Aerosmith, yet Sabbath lucked into one of the few fucking rappers who happens to give the beginnings of a shit about Black Sabbath, and somehow that's the collaboration that devours Donkey Dick? Eh, say la fucking V, but what do you expect from an album effectively recorded to fulfill a fucking contractual obligation? With Ozzy once again waving the proverbial pork steak over Iomi's head, teasing a reunion that wouldn't materialize for another two titty fucking years, it was important he shed himself of the existing IRS record deal, and yes, the drummer, bassist, and singer. The rumblings of reunion were particularly evident when Bill Ward stepped behind the drum kit on the subsequent tour, which, while excellent, also meant the Martin era was all but non-existent in the band's stage set around this time. The final curtain falling on the Forbidden Era with little more than a whimper as Black Sabbath had devolved into a nostalgia act on stage. And that, to date, is the last we've seen of perhaps the single most underrated vocalist in the history of Black Sabbath. Martin, for his part, would branch out into every genre under the yellow sun, including session stints in everything from doom metal maestro's Candle Mass to kick-ass AOR project The Cage. As for Black Sabbath, the aforementioned original lineup reunion would subsequently storm the globe in the late 90s, resulting in the Reunion Live album featuring a small handful of halfway decent original tracks. But this is the mythos, and I don't review compilation albums, so check that shit out on your own time, titwanks. Forbidden, for its own part, is a sonic schizophrenic breakdown. From track to track, it pinballs from badass to bullshit, and consequently lands somewhere in between on balance. The production is half the problem here, and if Iomi's intention to remaster it is to be believed, it may soon be time to give Tony Martin Sabbath a second listen. It almost goes without saying, but Tony Martin never receives his just due from Sabbath supporters. A rock-solid frontman who never once canceled a Sabbath show due to sickness, tiredness, pitchiness or bitchiness, possessing a jaw-dropping five-octave vocal range, only about three of which has ever been captured on a Sabbath release, it says a shitload of a lot when legendary drummer Cozy Powell, long after his tenure in Sabbath, with no incentive to blow smoke up the interviewer's ass, named Tony Martin as by far the band's best singer. Not Dio, Gillen, Hughes or Ozzy, all of whom Cozy has worked with before, Tony Fucking Martin! Choke on it, Martin haters! Next! I don't quite understand it, but they, they delete me or they don't talk about me for those 10 years of that history. But it's not just cutting me out of 10 years of the history, they're cutting themselves out. <laughs> dawn, metal began a slow rebirth. The world slowly, steadily recovered from the no-fun 90s, so that by 2004, the old guard of Iron Maiden, Motorhead, and Judas Priest were once again touring arenas the world over. Sadly, Black Sabbath were struck with an onset of bad luck, in particular Bill Ward, who suffered a heart attack before the 98 tour, and was promptly replaced by Vinnie Apice. And I had my heart attack. Ozzy came in, and 
said what he had to say and that meant an awful lot to me. I'm lying in the hospital bed. He liked to see the blood being drawn, to be honest with you. Then Giza came to visit me and he bought me a card and I thought, well, how nice. And I opened up the card and it said, congratulations on your new baby. A half-assed effort was made to record an all-new album with Rick Rubin, no less, in 2001, and according to Iomi, the tracks were even solid, but Ozzy up and left to work on solo shit, and apart from a Hall of Fame induction and hilarious appearance at Queen Elizabeth's Golden Jubilee in 2002, that was all she wrote for the remainder of the decade. Tony Blair came over and said, oh, Tony, I'm a big fan and I've got the album and all this stuff. Yeah. And then Ozzy came over, and it didn't even... Uh, acknowledged Tony Blair, he just came up to me and went, oh, 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 and went to us, uh, Tony Blair, and he went, oh, hello, and, <laughs> and walked off, and Tony Blair went, oh, oh, oh. It was like, oh, no. And so solo projects became the order of the day. Ozzy with his increasingly radio-friendly fucking embarrassment of a band, the Geezer Butler Band, and of course, Iomi, who at last got the multi-vocalist solo project extraordinaire he'd wanted to begin with, with a self-titled record in 2000 featuring the talents of the cults Ian Asbury, Henry Rollins, Peter Steele, Ozzy, and of course others. But in the meantime, a demo tape had circulated in the metal underground featuring the vocal talents of a by now delightfully sober Glenn Hughes provocatively entitled the eighth star, linked from an experimental mid-90s jam session, nothing was expected to materialize from the union until the bootleg in question forced Iomi's hand, and he at last dropped it as the 1996 DEP sessions. This album was bootlegged, I guess, sometime in the late 90s. I don't know how or why. We're both mortified by this. I didn't exactly know what to do with them, really. But we, you know, when I went back to visit them, I really liked them, and I thought it would be, be good to do them now. And while it features a fair few eyebrow-raising forays into melodic rock of the type that was popular on 90s rock radio, there's more than a slight slathering of Sabbath here as well. The song people want you believe in And song people want you for more And I won't deceive you, just let me receive The same thing we're both looking for what was that about Glenn Hughes not being a Black Sabbath vocalist again, shit dick? I won't linger on it over much, but if you enjoy the Seven Star, as I do, the 96 DEP sessions and their even heavier follow-up, Fused, are mandatory metal listening, particularly as this is likely our last chance to hear what a Hughes incarnation of Sabbath may have accomplished going forward, at least so long as Sharon Osbourne still breathes. If I have even a slight complaint where Fused is concerned, it's that on the first few tracks, Glenn seems somewhat subdued vocally, as he attempts to consign his soulful stylings to a more rock-oriented approach. Fortunately, as Fuse thunders on, his voice is given free reign, and Hughes lays down some of the finest vocal lines of his career. The 96 Death Sessions and Fused. Buy them if you can fucking find them. Purists might be wondering why I'm reviewing these two particular albums in the middle of a mythos about Black Sabbath, however. Well, beyond the fact that they're basically just Hughes-era Sabbath sequels, they also unwittingly spawned the reunion of the century. Heaven and Hell will always be my favorite album. Favorite to make, uh, favorite musically. And just because of the period of time that it was, uh, it was just so fulfilling, and, and I'm just sad that it, that it ended when it did uh, at that time. Not sad anymore. And now I have the incredible opportunity to come here to hang with three of the four guys who are part of this reunion. Ronnie James Dio, Tony Iommi, Geezer Butler, which is called Heaven and Hell. The 99 Black Sabbath reunion was a bit of a mixed bag of non-starter recording sessions and sporadic dates, culminating in precisely nothing of lasting merit. Sabbath, it seemed, was being held in stasis for Ozzy's convenience as he continued to milk the merry fuck out of the Osbournes reality show, 
thawing it the fuck out for festival dates every few years and nothing at all else. And whether that outside perception is actually accurate or not, it wasn't long before the remaining members were looking outside for inspiration. With the aforementioned Iomi albums in need of promotion, the planned touring package was a Sabbath fan's wet dream. Iomi featuring Glenn Hughes would tour for fucking Fused beneath the headliner none other than the Merlin of Metal himself. Dio! At the end of each show, or so it was planned at the time, all three men would occupy the same stage and sing Sabbath tunes from their respective eras. And then... Ozzy smacked Tony with a legal injunction over the Black Sabbath trademark, which, as we've already established, Tony Iommi acquired ahead of the Seven Stars release in 1986. Ozzy sued, you see, for the most equitable solution imaginable. Tony would own one half, he would own the other, and to hell with absolutely everyone else in the butt fucking band. <laughs> Oh, Ozzy, never change. Glenn Hughes fucked off to his solo career and later Black Country Communion, while a recent resurgence of interest in the Dio era catalog, thanks largely to the efforts of Tenacious D, led to the release of a Dio Years box set, featuring three all new Sabbath songs with Ronnie rocking the vocal duties hard. Okay, makes sense. We'll do, you know, write these two songs. So we embarked upon that one. I went over to England, went to Tony's studio. We wrote three songs instead of two because it just came so easy, which was a really nice thing because it proved how good we were at it and how stupid we were not, well, not me, but how stupid it was not to do that anymore. As you might expect, an all-new album soon came tumbling after, but with Sharon shrieking at Tony's lawyers from dawn to dusk, after all that Osborne's cash was two years gone by now and it was time to find a fresh money tit, to avoid any potential legal ramifications, it was decided to call the band Heaven and Hell, with Ronnie himself acknowledging that Sabbath, by any other name, is still Sabbath. They're gonna call us Sabbath anyway. It doesn't really matter, you know, we can call it heaven and hell or, you know, the boys boys on the on the block. It doesn't matter. They're gonna that's what we were, that's what we will always will be. So now something a bit more fresh. And the fans fucking agreed, slamming venues all across the United States for the legendary Metal Masters Tour of 2008, consisting of Testament, Motorhead, Judas Priest, and Heaven and Hell, they emphatically established that metal was not only alive and well, contrary to mainstream media coverage, the United States still wanted it, and they wanted Black Sabbath, whatever they happen to be calling themselves. 2009's The Devil You Know gave them precisely that, a doom metal monster lacking nothing in inspiration or urgency. While some have argued it's lost something over the intervening years, I argue the opposite. With the benefit of hindsight, particularly comparing this to the Aussie-fronted release to follow, this is about the last time Iomi consistently sounded like he gave even a fraction of a fucking shit, crafting some of the darkest, heaviest material of the metal maestro's career by far. We've written 13 songs already in this short period of time. And how many albums did Sabbath do when they got their reunion together? Uh, gee, I think you could count them on one zero almost. Yeah. You know, sure, there might have been a couple songs, but look how productive this band has been. The Devil You Know is not only top shelf Sabbath, it represents some of the most inspired output from both Black Sabbath and Ronnie James Dio in the post millennial era. It's harder to hunt down these days, but if you do, don't hesitate, nab it. The record was selling, the tours were sold out, at a time when OzFest had all but closed up shop, might I add. In short, things were going well for the reunited Dio incarnation of Black Sabbath. In fact, as history would sadly record, they were going just a little bit too well. We, you know, we've all had our ups and downs, and like everybody does. But at the end of the day, we all loved each other and, and, and really cared for each other. And, uh, you know, this last time was fantastic, everything was smooth, and that's it, it was, it was too good to be true. A heavy metal music icon is in Houston, dealing with some serious health issues. Dio has stomach cancer. This is the Ronnie James Dio few people have ever seen. He's a bit soft-spoken, 
Following this one is one definite more chemo procedure. He's relaxed. I just want to get better. I just want to be cured, you know. I refuse to be beaten in any way, shape, or form, so I'm going to beat this too. And the Golden God goes to... Ronnie James Dio! It's great to be back amongst people again. It's been a little while since I've been able to do that. Uh, and thanks, Revolver, for having a night for this kind of music. It's about time it happened for us, not anybody else. Rock in peace, Ronnie. Musically, Dio positively soars on this album. A fact by this point you almost took for granted, but really break this down. Dio was diagnosed and dead in six months. Not one year after this album drops, he was gone. Yet he turns in a career performance with stomach cancer regardless. But the way the story's told, they found me I'm not sure whose idea it was to hire a rejected Newgrounds Flash animator to do the music video, but we dig our own graves in this world. Yeah, it's, it's hey. a very good song, Great song, but the video, the video clip, oh, it's, unbelievable, it's isn't it? very strange. Oh, oh no, man. it very sucks, is how we say it. That There's actually some people that like it. I don't know. Oh, those are the blind people. Stevie yeah. Wonder liked Stevie. it. <laughs> yeah. Helen Keller. She yeah, Helen Keller loves it. She's, she's dead. dead. She's dead, yeah. Either way, it's impossible to overstate the impact of Dio's passing on the metal community at large. Much like Lemmy's more recent death, it's hard to process the fact that the world will never again hear another LOOK OUT! His funeral was well watched and attended, a bona fide rock and roll event where friends and fans alike paid tribute to a fallen icon. Sales of his album shot through the strap atmosphere, and in a sad irony, his version of Black Sabbath was now more in demand than ever. With a perpetually postponed tour already booked, a festival date at high voltage was instead performed by the godlike tandem of Dio Sandalag, Jorn Lande, and fellow Sabbath alumni, Glenn Hughes. We are here to celebrate the majesty, the magic of the greatest metal iconic singer of all time. Ronnie Jack! And then, just as they recovered from one cancer-related tragedy, fate came round for another fucking. The good news is your prostate's really good. Oh, great. He said, but we have found lymphoma in the lump. And uh, I oh no. And you'd, of course, only a year before lost Ronnie Dio, who'd been one of Ozzy's replacements as, as vocalist on Black Sabbath, to stomach cancer. Stomach cancer, yeah. Did you think you were going the same way? I did. The good news? It was treatable. The better news? It spurred Iommi to attend to unfinished business, beginning with Black Sabbath. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome four hard men from Birmingham, Black Sabbath. <laughs> We could sign it. I mean, it, we couldn't have done it any other. We tried when, you, when we did the reunion before, but it didn't work. But this time, for some magical reason, we've written about seven or eight songs over, and they're really good. I'm not just saying it. I'm like, wow, you know. The voice is Blues and jazz influenced heavy music. It's really pre-heavy metal, and we're trying to kind of put back in the other pieces. He sat us all down and put on the very first album that we made, and he said, forget everything else you've ever learned. Go back to this. The heavy metal hive mind alleges that where 2013's reunion and farewell showcase 13 is concerned, there can be no middle ground. You either worship every barefoot bar of Rick Rubin's reimagining of the vintage Sabbath sound, or you whisper voodoo incantations to assassinate same. Well, 
Ladies, gentlemen, Apache and hind helicopters of all makes and models, behold, for seated before you is the living embodiment of indifference. Don't hate it. Don't love it. I get the complaints, but I simultaneously acknowledge they're more exaggerated than Trump's Twitter feed and more than slightly informed by an earth-shattering, inexplicable hatred of the album's producer. Scoffing at the suggestion that haters of 13 are informed by personal peccadilloes and 15 metric cockloads of confirmation bias? <laughs> Do me a favor there, sugar nips. Find one, even one, negative review of 13 that never once utters the name Rick Rubin. See you next century! In short, it's a solid record I ain't gonna turn off, but neither am I left lusting after a fucking follow-up. About on par with, say, Dehumanizer. Not as bad as they say, but not the best either. Far and away, its most offensive affront is mere boredom, a relatively innocuous allegation given the drudgery is somewhat inherent to the doom metal genre Sabbath effectively invented to begin with. But judged objectively, while much of the album is indeed downpaced, it's not completely devoid of outright rockers. Actually, I take that back. Boredom is the second greatest affront after axing Bill Ward. Now, I won't get too deep into this bullshit. After all, metal fans have been inundated with back and forth about why Black Sabbath parted ways with Ward. The Sabbath side has repeatedly alleged Bill was, quote, unfit for a full world tour, and that's putting it diplomatically, with Ozzy occasionally calling him outright fucking fat, while Ward himself asserts he was simply never given a deal where he made more than a handful of fucking pocket lint by way of remuneration. Which, given that they ultimately settled on Ozzy's no-name session drummer to replace place him for pocket change has the faintest ring of fucking truth to it, you must admit. Iomi, for his part, has since said he has no idea why it never happened and that all matters relating to Bill were left to quote, management. That means Sharon. Far more offensive where the actual album is concerned is the inclusion of Politburo percussionist Brad Wilk of commie rockers Rage Against the Machine. Yeah, yeah, no politics. Yeah, yeah, it's just music. Gosh, if only Black Sabbath themselves had previously made emphatic statements about the mass murdering ways of the communist regime. I'm not anti-American, and I think that the Americans are the only ones that are combating communism in the world today. I don't agree with communism. No, they're, only, they're the only country who's big enough to really be so. There's no other countries that have big who can do anything against communism. Ah, from supporting America solely despite the champagne socialists of the 70s to hiring Leon Trotsky on the Tom Toms. Well done, fellas. More to the point, his drum work. Kinda fucking sucks. Where Ward's Ian Pace esque freeform precision provides the heartbeat of Black Sabbath, Wilk wails away until it sounds like something roughly approximating the 70s sound. And it eats. Operative lesson never let a Portland proctonaut from a footnote 90s radio rock act leech off a legendary band like Black Sabbath, much less during a crucial hour like their final curtain call. But in a musical sense, the album occasionally disappoints, but more often reminds you of the Sabbath of yore, and you ain't gonna want to hear this, but a lot of that is probably down to Rick Rubin. The execution may be off, but you can't fault the fellas for mostly making it happen. 13. Solid, but not exceptional. Unfortunately for Geezer Ozzy, Tony, and Ofe Guevara back there, a decent enough note to go out on. That wraps it up for this massive installment of the Metal Mythos. With a book of Black Sabbath finally closed, I will bid you all adieu until we emerge once more from the mists of the Metal Mythos. God fucking speed. Yeah.